welcome to our meeting tonight. Uh, my name is Gavin Merrifield and I will be chairing tonight's event. Uh, this event is being run by the Manchester Science and Philosophy Group, which is the name for the local group here in Manchester of a national organisation called Christians in Science. While our event tonight is from a Christian perspective, we welcome all those who are interested in this topic from whatever background you may have. If you do not know much about the CIS, uh, we are an organisation that works to bring together those who are interested in constructive interactions between science, church and Christian faith. Through events such as tonight's, we try to support those who have a personal or professional interest in this area. So you might be a scientist or a theologian, a teacher or a student, or perhaps even a church minister. But uh, you are all welcome here tonight. Hopefully you'll find tonight's event of interest, but it will also be helpful to your own personal journey of faith. Uh, you can view our past events on the CIS YouTube channel, where you'll also soon be able to find a recording of tonight's event. Uh, I imagine there'll be several fascinating ideas tonight that will be well worth uh, watching the, the talk again over to try and get our heads around them and ponder on them a bit more. If you'd like to know more about CIS or to support us by becoming a member or just by keeping in touch as a friend, then please check out our website at www.cis.org.uk. You can also follow our local Eventbrite page where you're registered for tonight's talk to keep up to date with our upcoming events here in Manchester. Uh, tonight's event is our third in of this year, which takes us halfway through our online programme for this spring and summer. I'm um, very excited to be welcoming Professor Mark Harris from the School of Divinity at the University of Edinburgh, where he is Professor of Natural Science and, and Theology. Mark also heads up postgraduate studies in science and religion in Edinburgh and is very involved in the field in both a national and international level through organisations such as the Science and Religion Forum and ESAT. Mark is also the author of two very excellent books uh, looking at this area and I can very happily recommend them both to you and I'm sure they won't be the last that he pens. His topic tonight is Theology of the Quantum World. So as well as his theological credentials, Mark is supremely qualified to discuss this area with us, having originally trained and worked as a physicist in this kind of area. This work included co-discovering the phenomena of spin ice that has led to uh, subsequent research published in over 5,000 papers, although I don't think Mark has written them all himself. Uh, but that's been over the last 20 years. So that's uh, quite a great uh, kind of legacy to have, really. So with that in mind, I'll hand you over to Mark to begin his presentation. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, Gavin. And it's great to be with you all. Um, the wonders of science, of course, in this age of lockdown. Um, I can't be in Manchester, sadly, but I'm just uh, outside Edinburgh. and. Uh, Anyway, it's great to be with you. I've given quite a number of talks to Christians in Science events before, not to Man a Manchester one though, so it sounds like you're absolutely flourishing. Um, great to be with you anyway. So what I'm going to give you tonight is really the kind of rough outline of a book project that I'm working on, on the way that theologians use quantum mechanics. So you're getting here my initial thoughts as I work through what, I, what I've discovered is a massive literature in both theology and physics as I'm sure you know, um, quantum mechanics is a complex area in its own right, uh, one of the most difficult in the whole of physics and philosophy of science. So I'll be pretty basic here as I set out the main ideas of the science, trying to focus especially on the conceptual understandings that theologians are attracted to in quantum mechanics. But first I want to make a caveat about what it means to understand quantum mechanics especially when we're using it for purposes other than physics, perhaps as here, um, constructing a theology of the quantum world. You'll probably know the quotation by Richard Feynman, one of, the, one of his many famous quotations. He said that nobody understands quantum mechanics. And yet, um, Gavin, before uh, my talk, shared a YouTube video on the Eventbrite page, which uh, was a kind of primer to, to everything the sort of basic ideas about quantum mechanics. And it started out by saying, actually, Feynman is wrong. We do understand quantum mechanics. I watched this with some amusement, really. Uh, I actually think that both are right in their own way. In my own scientific work, and I still do a little bit of physics, not a great deal these days, but I try to keep up. In my own scientific work, I carry on using the results and tools of quantum physics 
every day. And after several decades of working with it, I mean, it feels intuitive and natural to me. But if you were to ask me what it means at the deepest level, I have to admit that I will quickly start to struggle, as may become clear very shortly in this talk. But I know that I'm fairly typical of physicists. Um, quantum mechanics provides a wonderful set of predictive tools, and it unites huge areas of physics, chemistry, and biology too. But nearly a century after its formation, the jury is still out as to, to what precisely is it telling us about the reality of the quantum world. So with that caveat in mind, does it make sense to speak of a theology of the quantum world as I'm doing in my talk? Well, you'll find out towards the end that I'm not so sure about that myself. Um, it's not clear what we're making a theology of, is my opinion nor how we should go about it beyond the level of some quite interesting analogies between physics, quantum physics and theology. So you'll detect my skepticism as I work through this, particularly in the last third of my talk where I get into the theology. But I will try to be even handed. And of course, I would be fascinated to hear your own comments on this, whether I've been even handed enough and um, your, your own perspectives on how to do theology with quantum mechanics. This is a summary of what I'll cover. I'll start with the famous quantum measurement problem. Moving on to what does it mean? A lot of the famous things you'll probably have heard of, like Schrodinger's cat, before moving towards um, what, do, what do theologians do with this? A section I've just called quantum theology, for want of a better term. And then I'm going to finish with a, with a, a cautionary note come from John Polkinghorn about what he calls quantum hype. So, I'll introduce the, the basic weirdness of quantum mechanics, which is theologians find so attractive, by getting straight to the so-called measurement problem. And the easiest way to describe this is with the famous double slit experiment. And I'll show you some diagrams in a moment. This comes from the work of Thomas Young, um, who in, the, in 1803 demonstrated the Royal Society using this experiment that light is composed of waves. And this was against Isaac Newton's understanding that light was composed of particles, corpuscles. And in time, um, Young's result that light is essentially wave-like according to classical physics anyway, uh, was used by Maxwell when he um, formulated his theory of electromagnetism, one of the high points of classical physics. And Maxwell treated light as a disturbance of an electromagnetic field, and that allowed for, for in time, for full understanding of the, the full spectrum of light. So here's the diagram that I said that I would show you. At the top, this is the double slit experiment with plane waves coming in from the left, impinging on two slits in this screen. So it's a solid screen, and the, the light, or the waves anyway, can just get through the two slits. And you see they radiate out from the two slits in semicircular patterns. And where the peaks of the waves coincide, you get um, constructive interference. And where the peaks from the trough coincide, you get destructive interference. And so if you watch the, the way that the pattern starts to form on the detector screen there, you get this characteristic sign of, of wave-like behavior, an interference pattern, these fringes of um, bright and dark uh, light on the, on the screen. Now, what happens if we were to do just the same experiment, but to do it with particles? And we're still thinking classically here. So let's say we're doing it with a marble gun or something like that, firing them through the slits. And we've, we've, we've made them at appropriate sizes for mar that marbles can get through. What would we see? Well, of course, in this middle diagram, that shows exactly what we'd see. We'd see two bands of uh, you know, intensity, effectively, on the detector, where the, our marbles are being fired through these slits and hitting the screen at the back. What about if we do this with quantum entities, though, submicroscopic things like electrons or atoms? Well, this is the subject of the bottom diagram, which I'm going to focus on for a moment. If you start firing a whole load of electrons through the slits, and this is, of course, the way, effectively, the way that an old-fashioned TV used, used to work, um, cathode ray tube, then you'd see spots on the screen, depending on the intensity of the electron beam, um, and the individual spots, we would assume that this shows us that the electrons are particles. But notice that they dis these spots are distributed in an interference pattern, which suggests that there's some kind of wave-like behavior going on here. What's going on? Perhaps 
this is a property of electrons, that they are particles, because we see spots on the screen, but they somehow interfere with each other when there are lots of them passing through the slits. So let's send them through one at a time, and we can do this. And this is what we see. We actually, this is um, results of an result of an experiment um, where electrons are slowly sent through the apparatus, spots build up, seemingly at random at first, but after many, many, many events, you see that these spots start to form these characteristic stripes of the interference pattern. We're assuming that each electron passes through just one slit, but it seems that each electron knows, to use difficult language, human-like language, that there's another slit and it behaves accordingly by contributing to some kind of wave-like interference pattern. What's going on here? How does an electron do this? There's only one electron at a time in the system. I mean, what does it do? Is it splitting in half and going through both splits? Is it becoming a cloud and going through both slits at once? I mean, what, what, what can we do here to try and find out? Well, we can refine the experiment further. We could put a detector after one of the slits to see which of the two slits the electron has gone through. And sure enough, if we do this, we find that 50% of the time, the detector registers that the electron has gone through its slit, which implies that the other 50% of the time, the electron's gone through the other slit. What result do we see on our detector screen now at the back? Well, strangely, it's changed. The interference pattern has disappeared, and we now see two fringes, as in the middle scenario, when I said we were doing a classical experiment with particles, we were firing marbles through these slits. Well, what we've done here then, rather strange, we've confirmed that each electron goes through one slit or the other, like good little particles. But of course, remember, we saw an interference pattern before. Where's that gone? We kept both slits open, like before when we saw the interference pattern. All we've done is to watch one of the slits to see where see which electrons went through. It's almost as though our decision to see if the electron behaves like a particle has actually forced it to follow that behavior, to actually become more particle-like. Well, there's one last thing we can do, and uh, Jim Al-Khalili does a, there's a, there's a great video he does on YouTube where he demonstrates this. We can turn the detector off, but leave it there. Um, and what we find is the interference pattern returns. What's going on? What on earth is going on here? We still have the detector in place, we just turn the power off. Well, this is the heart of the measurement problem. The electron doesn't seem to have an objective nature of its own that we can determine clearly and surely. Merely by trying to measure if it's a particle or a wave, we forced it to go one way or the other. We are part of the measurement. Objective determinism has been lost. Well, sometimes you will see this or hear this explained as wave particle duality, which is the point that we need to understand quantum entities, electron atoms, molecules, subatomic particles, sometimes as waves, sometimes as particles, depending on the way that we're treating them. I hardly need to add that this is a complete paradox from the classical perspective. A particle, of course, is a tiny speck of stuff. It's localized in space. A wave is spread out in space. It's the complete opposite of a particle. How could one thing, an electron, for instance, be both a particle and a wave? It makes no classical sense at all. And even today, after you know a century of thinking and pondering about quantum mechanics, it still doesn't make much sense, to be honest. Well, one of the big milestones in the development of this subject is what we call Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in 1927. And a consequence of what I've been talking about so far, the measurement problem, wave particle duality, is that we realize, uh, encapsulated in the, the uncertainty principle, if we try to measure a basic property of the electron, such as its position, for instance, I called it X here, then it's related in a very peculiar and non-classical way to its momentum or velocity, if you prefer to think of it that way, I called it P. In fact, the more accurately you measure one, the less accurately you'll know the other. And there's nothing you can do about this, no matter how much you try to improve your experiment. You might be able to know the momentum very precisely, 
but you lose your knowledge of the position of the electron. And this leads to what's often called the loss of determinism in quantum physics. The quantum world is indeterminate and is better described in terms of probabilities and degrees of certainty rather than definite knowledge. Now, this has really important philosophical implications because one of the most important um, points about classical physics, um, that a complete knowledge of physical law would enable the future to be predicted, can no longer be maintained in the quantum world. We might be able to make really quite accurate predictions about quantum phenomena like radioactive decay, but these are statistical when we have many, many um, quantum events going on. There's a basic limit which we can't improve upon in principle. And this means that we can't predict the future in the sense of classical physics, not in principle in quantum mechanics. However good our science gets, get, um, nature is indeterminate at the quantum level. And this also means that we can no longer make the usual classical assumption that a cause precedes an effect. If nature is indeterminate at the quantum level, then our usual assumption of chains of causes and effects actually breaks down, at least at the quantum level, and it becomes difficult even to speak of a cause and effect in quantum mechanics. Now, let's look in more detail at the conceptual problems that arise and how people have tried to discuss this philosophically. And straight away, you need to start to turn to the, use the tools of philosophy here. Go back to the double slit experiment. This raises a question analogous to the famous problem of when a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, this, you probably know, um, boils down to the famous debate between realism and anti-realism. Is there a reality truly external to our minds? Is there something out there, really? That, that's realism. Or is it the case that because we apprehend the external world through our minds, then the only reality that we can be sure of is mental. Well, that's anti-realism. Well, Einstein and Niels Bohr, who was two of the early figures in the history of quantum physics, debated this very, very issue. Einstein was a very resolutely kind of convinced realist compared with Niels Bohr, who was much more of a kind of quantum anti-realist. Einstein asked Bohr, if he really believed that the moon doesn't exist, if nobody is looking at it. To which Bohr is said to have replied that however hard Einstein might try to prove the existence of the moon without observers, he would never succeed. And the realist or anti-realist issue in the quantum world is like that. We find that the simple act of us observing the quantum world creates it in a sense, in a double slit experiment, the way we try to observe the electron determines its basic reality, whether it appears as a particle or a wave. The observer has a decisive role in making reality, if you like, or at least this is the position of a popular interpretation of quantum physics, what we call the Copenhagen interpretation, due to Niels Bohr, who was from Copenhagen. Here, Physical reality is indeterminate. It exists in a variety of possible states all at the same time until it's observed, at which point those possibilities collapse to one in particular. So with an electron, for instance, we see either a wave or a particle. Now, there are various ways of construing the Copenhagen interpretation, and it's really more a collection of counterintuitive ideas around the measurement problem than a, than a single well-defined metaphysical position, but nevertheless, the most widespread or at least most popular account of Copenhagen has both elements, has elements of both realism and anti-realism in it. So the observer does make a difference to the quantum world, but there is a real world to make a difference to. And I'm sure you will have heard of this particular example, which is always used at this point in talks on quantum mechanics, namely that of Schrodinger's cat. Of course, this is a thought experiment. Um, you have a closed box containing a cat and a lethal device, which is triggered at some random moment. Perhaps you have a, a radioactive isotope, uh, which is decaying and triggering some lethal device entirely at random. So at any moment in time, you have no way of knowing whether the cat is alive or dead until you open the box. 
or shake it, as in the left-hand cartoon here. At that point, you've made an observation, and you know that the cat is either alive or dead, for sure. But what about before you open the box or give it a shake? What's the status of the cat then? Well, classical physics and, and human common sense would say that we simply can't know. But the cat must be either alive or dead. But according to the Copenhagen interpretation, the cat is both alive and dead simultaneously. Of course, that sounds like nonsense. But it, and it is a thought experiment, not a real life situation. Um, but while no one has tested this with a real life cat, it probably wouldn't work for other reasons, not least the macroscopic size of the cat. It has been tested at the microscopic level in the laboratory. And it is right, actually, the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment is basically correct that a quantum system exists or can exist in a state of what we call superposition. It can be described by several conflicting ontologies simultaneously. It's alive and dead at the same time. Now, some people have taken the anti-realism, which is implicit in Copenhagen, further still, and they've concluded the quantum mechanics tells us that reality is actually dependent on the mind, that our consciousness determines physical reality. Well, few working physicists, or at least that I know of, go with this, um, tending to prefer a fairly strong commitment to realism of some sort rather than anti-realism. And yet, Copenhagen, which does have a certain amount of anti-realism in it, has remained the dominant interpretation since the early days of quantum theory, to the extent that philosophers of physics, who are mostly pretty disparaging of Copenhagen, still call it the standard or orthodox theory of quantum mechanics, as though it's the default position in physics. But even Neil Bohr, who was the architect of the Copenhagen interpretation, um, he admitted that it wasn't easy. Um, here's a fam one of his famous quotes, and there are many, but this one is quite effective. Those who are not shocked when they first come across quantum theory cannot possibly have understood it. And I'll admit that, you know, decades later, I am still shocked by this when I, when I think hard about, about what it means. And of course, Einstein was famously troubled by the Copenhagen interpretation. He believed that a deterministic solution would present itself one day, that Copenhagen wasn't right. It was just a, a kind of a, something we have to live with for now until someone develops something better. And this is what he said in a letter to Max Born. Quantum mechanics is very worthy of regard, but an inner voice tells me that it's not the true Jacob, Jacob being the, of course, the patriarch of the 12 tribes of Israel, to the point of origin, if you like. And he goes on to say, the theory yields much, but it hardly brings us close to the secrets of the old one, secrets of God. In any case, I'm convinced that he does not play dice. You believe in a God who plays dice, and I in an incomplete law and order in a world that objectively exists. Well, interesting. Most of us physicists, I think, also believe in a world that objectively exists, that um, obeys law and order. But we've become so accustomed over time to the kind of God plays dice way of thinking in the Copenhagen interpretation that we are stuck in a rather Jekyll and Hyde situation, really. But there are alternative interpretations to Copenhagen. So as Einstein hoped, deterministic solutions did present themselves in time, stemming from the belief that there must be an objectively real world out there which isn't influenced by the observer, where cause and effect are meaningful. And the, the, the chief of these is probably the, the various collection of hidden variables um, theories. And the idea here is that there are parameters in the theory that we simply can't know, but even if we could, it would, uh, but, but if we could, they, it would result in a fully determined future, but we can't in principle know them. So full determination isn't possible. Now this is why empirically, quantum mechanics gives us statistical predictions, goes the reading, it's not an exact theory of nature because there are hidden variables we can't see. And the best known of these kinds of interpretation comes from de Broglie and Bohm. And this works with the idea that quantum entities like electrons are certainly particles with definite positions, 
but each has a pilot wave spread out in space. So it's a kind of mixed economy, if you like, um, between uh, where quantum, article, quantum entities are waves and particles at the same time, even before we observe them. Interestingly, I discovered that while this viewpoint is actually very popular with philosophers of physics, it has very little support among working physicists, many of whom have never even heard of it. Everyone has heard of this one though, the many worlds interpretation. This is particularly popular among cosmologists, although vastly more speculative than hidden variables. Um, this interpretation is fully deterministic against the Copenhagen interpretation. And so in, in, in the many worlds interpretation, all possibilities in the quantum world are real, determinate, and they exist in parallel with each other, almost as though we might talk about parallel universes. So for instance, every time Schrodinger's cat turns out to be alive, there's another world, or, or strictly speaking, another branch of the universal wave function where it's dead. Both branches are equally real and both contain human observers. Each set of inhabitants though, cats and humans, perceives only their own branch of reality. So this is a fully realist and a fully deterministic interpretation, unlike Copenhagen, but clearly it's got a certain level of bizarreness about it. Well, there are other interpretations of quantum mechanics, which tend to be, again, deterministic compared with Copenhagen. Um, the most important ones focus on the collapse of the wave function, the measurement problem in other words, by introducing some kind of objective mechanism for the collapse to occur, quite apart from whether it's being observed by a human observer or not. Again, these have some support from philosophers, but little that I know of among working physicists. And I think it's important to remember that the empirical science, the experiments and the, the, the theories, equations, while raising these extraordinary questions about the nature of reality, can't actually answer them. The various interpretations I've listed here, including Copenhagen, are all metaphysical in effect. They tell us about reality on a deeper level than what we can probe experimentally. All of these interpretations are therefore consistent with the experimental observations, even if they're vastly different in ontological, in reality terms. And the observations, our experiments, can't help us decide between them. What do ordinary working physicists think about this? Well, to be honest, most of us just get on with the science without worrying too much about the metaphysics. And this is a position known as instrumentalism. And it's best captured by a very famous quotation of David Mermin his objection towards any philosophical talk about what does all this mean, that we should just shut up and calculate, just get on with it and stop worrying. So the Copenhagen interpretation is probably still the working um, interpretation that, that most physicists have in the back of their minds because of its historical authority and its simplicity compared with some of the other interpretations but I suspect that most of us find its anti-realism pretty difficult if we're honest with ourselves, but we are able on a day-to-day -day basis to largely ignore these problems because of the sheer unrivaled power of quantum mechanics. Whenever it can be tested, quantum mechanics comes out with flying colors and it binds together huge areas of, of physics, chemistry, and biology, surely, quantum mechanics is grasping at something which is really true and really real, we, we might hope, however uncomfortable we might find the philosophy. I guess, and I'm speaking personally, but I've heard other physicists say this, it's one of those questions that many of us shelve for retirement when we'll have a bit more time and we'll really try to understand quantum mechanics then. Let me talk about one last um, strange issue of quantum mechanics before getting on to the theology. And this actually is, a, 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 theologians find this a particularly attractive aspect of quantum mechanics. This is called the EPR paradox, stands for Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen. It comes from an objection that Einstein put forward to Niels Bohr, um, which is named after the, the, the three people who put it together, including Einstein. Um, Einstein, as I said, was never happy with the Copenhagen interpretation. He was often trying to find 
counterexamples to it for Neil Sport. You think, explain this. How, how, can, how did your interpretation understand this? He always felt that further work would show it to be mistaken that actually nature is deterministic at its basis, that it is meaningful to speak of the distinction between observer and observed. And um, the EPR paradox is really a thought experiment that Einstein and his co-workers came up with to, to demonstrate that Bohr's position couldn't be right. Well, it works around an idea called entanglement. This is the idea that two particles that interact in the quantum world are then bound together or entangled such that if we make a measurement on one, we equally know what the other is doing, however far away it is. And in this thought experiment, we take two entangled particles, say electrons, for instance, and we separate them by a great distance. And it can be as far as you like. It makes no difference, even opposite ends of the universe in principle. You now make a measurement on one of them, say distance or momentum, and you find that your measurement determines what the other particle is doing, even though the other particle is so far away that no information can have traveled between them in the time available, even traveling at the speed of light. Now, Einstein referred to this as spooky action at a distance. It was a very uncomfortable idea for him. He felt that it was such an absurd scenario that it couldn't possibly be true. Quantum mechanics might predict this, but it can't possibly be right. There must be some incompleteness to the quantum theory. Well, um, experimental work since then has showed that it's actually probably right, and that two entangled particles do indeed behave like this, even when separated by a great distance, which has um, acted as a kind of verification of, of the quantum mechanical picture if not Copenhagen itself. Um, but to be fair to Copenhagen, the viewpoint there is that well, we don't really have two particles at all until we try to observe them. We have one entangled quantum entity spread out over a huge distance, which collapses into two particles as soon as we measure it. This is what we mean when we refer to non-locality. We can no longer assume here, as we did in classical physics, that we have individual entities at the quantum level, which we can isolate and treat on their own. Instead, we have relations. So in the quantum world, relations are more important than individuals, and that's a consequence of non-locality. Now, that point about relations has been enormously influential among theologians, and as you can probably guess, um, the emphasis on relations over individuals means that it's actually become quite a useful analogy for describing um, theological conundra like the incarnation of Christ and the Trinity. And so in my third section, I'll outline what I'm calling quantum theology, theology done in the quantum world, if you like, and the incarnation and the Trinity are two of the things I want to talk about. There are four main ways I've come across that quantum theory is used in theology. So the incarnation of Christ, eco-theology and holism, divine action, and the quantum trinity. And I'll take these in turn. Let's start with the incarnation of Christ. So this first um, version of quantum theology, if you like, uses quantum mechanics to construct a metaphor or an analogy of the incarnation. So this is the mystery of how Christ can be both divine and human simultaneously, and yet one person. And the, this particular analogy says that this is, this is rather like wave-particle duality in quantum mechanics. Remember that depending on how we look at an electron in the double slit experiment, we see it as either a wave or a particle, but nevertheless, it's one thing, it's an electron. And this goes, the analogy, is like the incarnation of Christ. If we contemplate Jesus as a divine being, as the son of God, we see his divinity. If we focus on his humanity, on the other hand, we see his human nature. Nevertheless, he's one being. Well, this analogy between Christ and wave-particle duality has been made many times by theologians since at least the 1950s. That's as far back as I can trace it anyway. It does, though, have some problems about how to affirm the unity of Christ, namely the point that he is one being, both human and divine. 
think about the famous Council of Chalcedon back in the the years of uh, you know, the, the early church centuries in the year 451. There had been previous controversies about how to solve the problem of who is Christ? How do we speak of him as a unity whilst he's God and human at the same time? And the council made this definitive statement that Christ is both human and, night, human and divine in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, the distinction of the natures being in no way annulled by the union, but rather the characteristics of each nature being preserved and coming together to form one person and subsistence. In other words, this definition is telling us very clearly that at all times, Christ is human and Christ is divine, and yet he's one being. But wave particle duality isn't like that. We only see an electron as a wave or a particle when we make a measurement, at which point we see the classical concept of wave or particle. But before that, the electron is a fully quantum entity, and the classical language of wave or particle is unhelpful, or inaccurate. So before measurement, at least in the Copenhagen interpretation, we have neither a wave nor a particle. We have an electron, whatever that is. But Christ is always human and divine, not only when we, me when we measure him, so to speak. So wave-particle duality is, it has its strengths and weaknesses, really. It only works rather loosely as an analogy. But if you look closely at it, um, it gets the nature of Christ's reality, particularly as he is in himself, um, wrong, I, I would say. Let's look at the, the second kind of quantum theology I want to look at. Um, this is eco-theology and holism. This is the way that quantum mechanics has been used in theological treatments of ecology, or eco-theologies, as they're sometimes called. And here you would use um, quantum mechanical non-locality, non entanglement in other words, as a metaphor for the fact that humans are not only situated in the natural world, but we're part of it. We're inter intimately connected to it. So entanglement is effectively a metaphor for telling us that we are interconnected with nature at every level. And clearly this has ecological dimensions. Now, I should note that David Bohm himself is an important theorist in quantum physics. And I mentioned his um, hidden variables uh, idea earlier on. He promoted this kind of thinking with his book, Wholeness and the Implicate Order. He says that quantum mechanics points to an implied but hidden order in the world, a level of reality which underlies what we experience with our everyday senses. This implicate order connects the human body and mind to the wider universe. It provides a unifying ground of being to all of reality. So humans aren't individuals with projections of a single totality. Now, ideas like that have been quite influential amongst Christian theologians as well, particularly those trying to develop eco-theologies. And one of the, the best known that I am aware of is by Virginia Stem Owens in her book, And the Trees Clap Their Hands. She tells us that the whole of the natural world is unified thanks to um, quantum entanglement and that we're a part of it and this should form part of our spirituality. And she describes how ancient cultures had a much clearer sense of this than us. And we've rather disparagingly referred to this as animism when looking at ancient cultures. But it's time, she thinks, that we um, embrace quantum physics and come to, um, you know, look at this ancient way of thinking and interconnection again. And she develops a kind of pan-sacramental view of the whole universe and comes out in this very memorable phrase, all of the world is one great sacramental loaf. Um, she's using the Christian sacrament of communion and entanglement at the same time in order to connect nature together into one sacred entity in which God can be manifest. Let me go on to my next possible way of talking about theology of the quantum world. This is by far the biggest of all of them. So much has been published in this area, it completely uh, dwarfs the other areas. This is divine action. How does God work in the natural world, or the human world for that matter? This has deba been debated since at least the 1950s, um, like I said. Um, 
again, it tends to rely on the Copenhagen interpretation, effectively saying that since nature is fuzzy and indeterminate at the quantum level, there's plenty of wiggle room for God to manipulate natural causes and to bring about his purposes in the world. And since this viewpoint relies on quantum indeterminacy, um, I tend to call this the God plays dice school of thought, as against Einstein's God does not play dice. And the best known version of this is by the theologian R.J. Russell. And he's, he's well known for his acronym, his, sorry, his acronym NIODA, stands for Non-Interventive Objective Divine Action. He says that God works through quantum mechanics, through every single quantum event there is in nature. Um, and this means that God isn't intervening in the world as if it's a closed, fixed natural order. God is working in an open universe. God is working objectively in every single quantum event to guide the direction of the world. But since quantum mechanics is indeterminate, we can never detect God's hand. But nevertheless, it's there. Well, there are at least three problems with this. The first is um, what's often referred to as God of the gaps, where we're tying God's work into something that science doesn't understand clearly at the moment, but perhaps as the science changes, and this has often happened in history in the past, as the science changes, God gets squeezed out of that gap in our knowledge. The second problem is what I what one might be referred to as occasionalism. This is a very um, ancient philosophical view, especially in Islam, that there are no laws of nature as such because God has causal control over every single event and every moment of time in the world. It just appears to us that there are laws of nature because God's work is so regular. And the trouble with this particular view of occasionalism is that the more emphasis we place on God as the determining cause of all events in the world, the less we place on the autonomy of nature. So God effectively becomes nature and becomes the source of all evil as well as good. So this is something preferably to avoid. And it is a, it is a problem with this particular version of di divine action. And the final problem to, to note is that um, in the Copenhagen interpretation, it's really only the act of measurement that's indeterminate. Um, because the way before measurement, the wave function evolves in a fully deterministic way. So it's not clear how God's action at the quantum level corresponds to a measurement. This is something that hasn't really been clearly um, developed in this particular uh, version of divine action. I'll just turn to my last kind of quantum theology, looking at the nature of God, the Holy Trinity. And theologians have used wave particle duality again as a loose analogy for Father, Son and Holy Spirit, so three persons in one. And the problems that arise with that are similar to those I mentioned earlier with Christ. But what's more interesting, I think, is the way that quantum entanglement has been used to explain how the three persons are bound together into one God. And the most fully worked out version of this I know is by Ernest Simmons in his book, The Entangled Trinity. He makes use of the ancient patristic concept of perichoresis. This is a Greek term. It refers to how the three persons of the Trinity are engaged in a kind of divine dance of mutual indwelling with each other. And a good analogy, Simmons suggests, is quantum entanglement. In their inner life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are entangled with each other in some kind of entangled perichoresis. They're like three quantum entities bound together intimately. They're indistinguishable until we make a measurement, at which point one of the three persons emerges. So our prayer life is like a, a quantum observation. We address one person, the Trinity, and depending on what theological question we're asking, we see that person. So when we're looking for um, que questions about what we're praying or thinking about creation or questions of origins, we would see God the Father, the Creator. When we're looking for forgiveness, we find Christ and so on. So his point is that the one divine reality is an entangled superposition of three states of God. And his emphasis here is on relationality again, which entanglement allows him to do. Now, this has all been at the level of, of analogy so far, but he does go further than this, because not only are the three persons of the Trinity entangled with each other, but Simmons is able to um, explain that the Trinity is 
is entangled with the created world. And this, that's because he, has, he goes beyond traditional theism to use a viewpoint called panentheism. This is where um, the being of God is much more intimately associated with nature than in traditional theism. Um, so effectively, he's, he's really kind of stepping beyond the analogy role of quantum theology, almost starting to make an identity between the idea of entanglement and, and the, what the way that, um, that God is interacting with the world. Well, I'm going to finish now with some comments by John Polkinghorne, who quite rightly, I, in my view, I'd be interested to hear what you think, quite rightly complains of the traits that he sees in theology, a kind of readiness to jump on the quantum bandwagon without a clear understanding of just how specialized and technical the language is. And this is what he says from his book, Quantum Physics and Theology. He says, quantum height, this is his term, quantum height, it's the invocation of the peculiar character of quantum thinking as if that was sufficient license for lazy indulgence in playing with paradox and other disciplines. The strangeness encountered at different levels of reality have characters that are idiosyncratic to those levels and no facile kind of direct transfer is possible between physics and theology. So I think he's making quite a serious warning here not to take the language and do what we will with it, but to understand exactly, carefully at any rate, the kind of levels on which it works in quantum physics before making translations. And in fact, in his, in his book, he is very, very careful about um, making clear that he's analogizing, not making identities. But I, I won't say any more about that at the moment, because I realize that my time is coming to an end. And I would, I'm just simply going to make my own feelings clear here. I think my, I would, feel rather similarly to John Polkinghorne. Um, the readiness of theology to jump on the quantum bandwagon is a bit of a problem, particularly because it's the Copenhagen version of that bandwagon. Copenhagen clearly provides a level of mystery which is attractive to theologians, especially when they're concerned to escape from the determinism of classical physics, the idea of a closed world that God can't work in. But remember that Copenhagen is only one interpretation among many, and one which comes with substantial baggage, such as its anti-realism. And it's interesting to note that philosophers of physics have largely moved away from Copenhagen in favor of more realist and deterministic interpretations, but theologians seem to resolutely stick to Copenhagen. I think that's a shame, and it indicates that theology has only engaged with this area on a rather superficial level at the moment. And I would hope that theology of all subjects would be about engagement with wisdom at its deepest level, both human and divine. So at the moment, you can tell I, I'm rather skeptical of this area. I'm not sure, personally, that there is a special theology of the quantum world, which doesn't turn out to be a theology of the classical world in disguise, but that's partly because I want to encourage theologians to go deeper into the science and see what they can find beyond Copenhagen. But anyway, I've, I've come to the end of my talk and I would be fascinated to hear what you think about these kind of challenges I've posed. Um, you may well disagree with me. I'd be fascinated to hear that too. Thank you very much, Mark. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, we've got a few questions starting to come in, but just as we just allow a few minutes for more people to write theirs, can I just ask you a little bit about yourself? Um, how did you make the transition from physics to theology? And how did you uh, end up in Edinburgh? Uh, two questions, really. So, yeah, um, I actually started out my first degree is in earth science. Uh, I became absolutely fascinated with the physics of minerals. So my PhD was in an area called mineral physics, which is a kind of crossover between crystallography and physics. Um, and that meant that when it came to think about, well, what do I do at the end of my PhD? A postdoc came up in Oxford Physics, which was just ideal for me, and and I was offered it. So I went I went across there. At all this time, I didn't really think very clearly about the future, except that I really enjoyed doing physics, really enjoyed doing experiments. Um, I ended up uh, working at the Rutherford Appleton Lab near Oxford as one of the staff scientists there. And after about ten years of this, I started thinking. Um, do I, do I want to spend my entire life doing this? And I think by this time, I was um, 
very heavily involved in my local Anglican church, and also becoming very, very intrigued by the kind of basic fundamental questions that physics was raising for me, the kinds of things that I've been talking about here. So um, I started asking uh, a local vicar about ordination, and uh, just it just seemed to ring so many bells for me. So I um, went to see the, the, dio the diocesan director of ordinance. He was very encouraging. I guess they don't get too many scientists, or they didn't then anyway, coming forward for asking about ordination. Um, one thing was interesting, though, or at the time it was a bit of a challenge. So this, this guy, the DDO, he said, um, well, you'll have to do the degree in theology first of all. Now, oh, no. Um, three years of more study. Um, I'm sure I, I'm a very arrogant physicist. I thought, yeah, I must understand, you know, theology is probably pretty simple compared to physics. And I probably know most of what I need to know anyway. So I was you know, certainly a, a degree of heavy heartedness when I went into studying theology. But within weeks of doing it, I discovered that it was absolutely fascinating and intellectually very, very challenging as well. And so at that point, I think I decided that I'd quite like to, to move towards uh, academic theology. So to cut a long story short, um, I was ordained, worked in a parish, ended up being um, a university chaplain. And then this job in Edinburgh came up to um, construct a brand new master's in science and religion. And that's what I started. Well, that's what I do now. So um, I've been in Edinburgh for eight years now, working on working with postgraduate students, training them in the science and religion field. So what kind of areas uh, is Edinburgh focusing on in terms of kind of new research and new thinking? Yeah, so I suppose um, it's difficult to escape the fact that as a physicist, someone interested in natural science rather than human sciences, so we have a lot, quite a lot, quite a lot of people interested in working on that. So we have a we have quite a few PhD students as well. But um, some of my colleagues are more interested in the way that the human sciences, such as psychology and anthropology, engage with religious belief as well. So we also have um, uh, students working in those areas as well. And also some more traditional theologians also get interested in the whole science and theology area too. So um, it's, as you can imagine, a very interdisciplinary area. And so I feel as though I'm constantly on, on my toes trying to keep up <laughs> with, with too many sciences, really, as well as what's going on in theology and philosophy. Excellent. It's good to be kept on your toes. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll go on to some questions uh, on your talk now. Uh, so we have a question on uh, problems uh, encountered when scaling up from quantum behavior into more classical scales uh, and how this relates to ideas of entanglement or causality in large systems. Uh, could you make a comment on that at all? How we scale up for large systems? Yeah, I wish I knew the answer to this one. Um, this is one of the many questions that could be answered. Are asked where you will expose my complete lack of understanding. So this effectively, uh, to me, is asking a similar question to where does the classical world begin and the quantum world stop, or you know, other way if you're looking in the other direction. Um, I think that none of us really knows the answer to that. Um, physicists who, you know, work in working physics, we still have this Copenhagen mindset, which means we, we see see reality in terms of two worlds, the quantum and the classical. So we, we see this boundary, but we don't know how to, we don't know how it, one crosses it. We don't know where to place it. We don't know if it, it moves as you look at different systems with different um, kinds of experiments. Um, philosophers, I mean, actually it, it's been fascinating uh, doing the research for this book because for the first time in my life, I've read a great deal of philosophy of physics. And I've been, amazed to find that they are generally very skeptical of the way that we working physicists treat quantum mechanics and the way that we are kind of stuck in this Copenhagen rut and don't seem to be interested or able to um, ask questions and to look at the other interpretations that are out there, other interpretations which don't have this problematic boundary between classical and quantum. So um, I realize that I'm giving you a slightly kind of shaggy dog story answer, <laughs> but it's simply because I don't I don't know how to how to talk about you know scaling up. When does the microscopic become the macroscopic? When does quantum become classical? It's something we throw around all the time, but I'm afraid I, I don't have a clear answer beyond that. 
one of the big problems of, of the standard understanding of quantum mechanics. It seems to me that every other year I see a paper uh, with the kind of twin slit experiment done with first electrons, then molecules, then large scale kind of carbon nanomolecules. Uh, so they seem to be pushing the boundaries of that. But what that actually means, I think we, we're still really not sure. Uh, another right, yeah. question. Uh, do you think quantum mechanics can teach us anything about the nature of time and perhaps God's relationship to time? I saw that one. Yes. Um, really interesting question. Uh, I think that, so, so, again, this is pushing very much at the limits of my understanding because this is where quantum, we talk, we'd be talking about the boundary between quantum mechanics and relativity, special and general. And while there are forms of quantum physics which are relativistic, um, quantum field theory, for instance, uh, no one has been able to um, turn quantum physics into a theory which works with gravity, so fully coherent with general relativity. And that's where our scientific understanding of time would be become much um, much more coherent, I suppose. So I think that at the moment, uh, it, it's unclear what quantum physics tells us about time. And certainly in the non-relativistic version of quantum mechanics that I've been talking about, uh, time doesn't really play much of a role, except that when you come to, if you're, if you're content to stay with the Copenhagen interpretation, as I mentioned, it undermines the idea of causality at the quantum level. We, we can't realistically or meaningfully talk about cause and effect at the quantum level if we're adhering to Copenhagen. And of course, it's cause and effect that is what tells us how time flows. So without, um, without causation, it's very, very tricky, I think, to understand what time means. Um, and so from that point of view, non-relativistic quantum mechanics in the Copenhagen mold um, probably does have a rather tricky relationship with time. Yeah, I think there's uh, big questions over what, what time is uh, in any part of yeah. uh, the physics at the moment anyway. Uh, yeah, there's uh, quite a few questions actually on, on the topic of time, so I think we might have covered a few of them in one go there. Uh, what does quantum physics say about the omniscience and omnipotence of God? Gosh, another great question. So I, as you picked out, or as you will have picked up, um, I'm rather skeptical as to whether quantum physics has much to tell us about God in God's own self at the moment, beyond the level of rather nice analogies, which, you know, have their strengths and weaknesses. So I think that personally, quantum mechanics, well, and the other problem is, of course, we, we, we don't really think that we understand it very well. Um, it, it, okay, again, if we're adhering to the Copenhagen uh, interpretation, and it's true that nature at the quantum level is completely indeterminate. It doesn't mean anything to talk about causation. It doesn't mean anything to talk about waves and particles at the quantum level or about definite properties. Well, does God know these things? So, so we may not be able to tell whether an electron is a wave or a particle until we measure it. But does God know before us? Really difficult question. Mm. Theologians have been debating this for some time, particularly in the divine action. I didn't mention this as one of the one of the problems that's often discussed. So we might say that um, you know, God works with the indeterminacy of quantum mechanics. God can push atoms around or electrons around. We, we wouldn't see it because of the principle, of, you know, the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. But Copenhagen tells us that actually there is no reality as such to push around. Um, electrons aren't waves or particles until we see them. So you've got a really basic philosophical question here about how seriously do you take Copenhagen before we even start to ask about what does God know about the world? Maybe there is nothing to know about the world. See what I'm getting at hmm. here. Um, so I think that we need to, before doing the theology, to start looking at the other interpretations of quantum mechanics, um, not just Copenhagen. What do they help? What do they add? What do they take away? Um, at the moment, I think the theology is just simply too, too wedded to Copenhagen to, to really see the wood for the trees in, in this area. Uh, 
Uh, we've got a question on the Copenhagen interpretation. Uh, Peter says that there seems to be two boundaries between the microscopic and the macroscopic, and then between the interaction with the macroscopic and its perception by the human mind. Uh, how important is the human observer in the Copenhagen interpretation? That might tie into another question where someone is wondering about the nature of free will and determinism in quantum mechanics. Yeah, both of those are great questions, which are often um, posed to the Copenhagen area. So first of all, it's important to bear in mind that there is no such thing as the Copenhagen interpretation, although I keep talking about it as though there is, and you'll hear, you know, often hear it spoken of as the Copenhagen interpretation. There are actually many versions of it, which are, which are subtly different, but they all tend to focus on the measurement problem. Um, some of the other, the other interpretations don't really see this as a problem, actually. It's, it's only a problem, really, in the Copenhagen interpretation. And one particular set of versions of Copenhagen interpret the measurement problem as being um, the interaction between mind and matter, if you like. That uh, it is the interception between human consciousness and the physical world, which is where um, measurement occurs where the wave function collapses but without consciousness you know the quantum world just carries on in its own merry way and without that, that, that kind of measurement action um now someone uh there was the other question about free will as well those who theologians who like to use the Cop copenhagen-ish interpretations um to create some wiggle room for God to move atoms around and, and influence the direction of the world, um, often make exactly the same point about human free will. Um, if there is no such thing as deterministic uh, physics going on in our brains, if it's all fuzzy to some degree, then that helps us to affirm free will. It says, that, of course, humans must have free will. It's not the case that the future is determined by physics. It's nature is fuzzy at its basic level. So um, you'll, you'll find that the free will debate is a kind of mirror image of what's going on about the divine action debate. And because Copenhagen is so helpful here in creating wiggle room, it tends to be relied upon a lot by those who want to argue for divine action, argue for free will. But there are many other people who would say, well, these are irrelevant because free will and um, divine action can occur even in a fully determined universe, deterministic universe. Thank you. Um, what, another question, sorry, what are the best theological and pra possibly practical tools to help us resist the easy temptation of quantum hype in our theology? Is there a role for increasing basic scientific education in both our churches and society? Uh, in order to help them see through such quantum foaming? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And clearly you, you've taken up on the, the kind of what, what I was hinting at in my conclusion. Um, I think personally, theologians need, it would be great if theologians um, were educated more thoroughly in science, I suppose. Of course, you know, do a degree in theology, you've got a lot of theology to learn, first of all. But insofar as science is making main challenges to, to religious belief these days, insofar as we often talk about science and theology, science and religion, I think that you know theologians, it's incumbent upon them, us, to try to do our best to understand the science. And, and particularly with quantum mechanics, it's rather too easy to pick and choose the, the bits that you like and not to necessarily struggle with the rest of it and try to see it in context. And I think that was basically what John Polkinghorne was saying, about, you know, don't, don't pick things out of one level of science uh, and translate them over into your own interests without being aware of the very technical context in which they, they come. So, um, yeah, I, I think this, is, this, is, this has been part of, my, I suppose, my own, my own bugbear working in the science and theology field. I, I, I try to suggest to theologians that we need, you know, we need to talk more seriously about what quantum mechanics is before we apply it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky concept for even kind of people working with it. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I've been working with it for 30 years now. I struggle with it all the time. Um, but I, I'm convinced that it's worthwhile. And, um, and there are some great books and great, uh, uh, great bits and pieces on YouTube, for instance, such as the thing that Gavin, uh, created a link to in the Eventbrite page. There's some great stuff out there which explains it well and explains it um, without making, um, you know, making use of the easy routes to quantum hype. Yeah. Um, so just two quick questions to finish up. Um, what is the key lesson you would like Christians and the church to take on board from uh, your research into quantum theory? Oh, gosh. Um, I think this is, this is an incredibly exciting area. Um, we all hear uh, when we're at school and university about how, um, how fundamental physics is in the hierarchy of science, or at least I did. Um, I'm assuming that most of us do in kind of popular consciousness. And here we have the most kind of fundamental level of reality. But the science is totally difficult and confusing and complex, and even the experts don't understand it. I think this is really, really exciting. Um, and I would just encourage people to try to get to grips with it, really. If, if you think I'm right, that this is, um, you know, if, if reality is really so strange and confusing at its basic level, then this is surely something we need to get to grips with. Um, and I tend to believe, and, and I hope that history has borne me out, borne me right on this, that good science tends to lead to good theology. Um, mm -hmm. It might, there's a bit of a lag, but it happens in the end. Going back to Galileo and Newton, um, you can see it right through the history of science. Not quite sure we've got there with, uh, with quantum mechanics yet, but, you know, you take the long view, hopefully good theology will come out of it. I was going to comment that uh, quite often discussions on science and religion in church can be dominated uh, by evolution and biology or ethics and sometimes cosmology, but it's uh, not quite so common that uh, physics or chemistry kind of get much of a look in themselves. So there's uh, plenty of scope for any of us who are working in our churches uh, as scientists uh, to kind of broaden the field, as it were. Uh, so one final question. Uh, how do your academic studies impact your own personal faith? Um, it's more, I suppose, that my personal faith led me to the academic studies because I really wrestled with these issues when I was working in physics. Um, and it, it, I can't see an easy separation between my getting involved with this, my local parish church, like I said, and the kind of intellectual struggles I was having with what's, this, what's physics for, what does it mean, what am I supposed to be doing with it, um, it's all part of a package deal for me. So I think, uh, you know, my, my faith, my personal faith and my academic interests have always gone hand in hand. And um, it's one of the great things about working at Edinburgh. I've been encouraged to uh, just explore them as, as I wanted to, really. So uh, it's, it's a great place to work in the School of Divinity at Edinburgh because there's so supportive of the whole science and religion enterprise. So I guess I tended to see it as a sort of faith vocation to explore science and theology um, personally and as an academic. So I hope, I realise that isn't true for everyone, but I think all of us, I'm sure all of us here are interested in science and interested in theology too, and we'll all find different ways of uh, realising that interest. I hope that people can find ways of, you know, using it, science and religion, um, with their congregations, though, and, and their friends and so on. Um, I, for, for too long, we've been told that science and religion are in conflict with each other. Uh, so thank you again to Mark for his absolutely fantastic presentation and then the discussion afterwards as well. Thank you all for your questions as well. They've been really great to, to see, and it's great to see so many of you here tonight as well. Uh, before we go, I just want to briefly remind you of our next few events. Uh, because of Easter, we are going to sidestep our next date slightly later into April. Uh, so our next event is on April the 12th, when the Reverend Dr. David Gregory will be joining us to explore the connections between spirituality and scientific imagery of all types, uh, not just paintings, but uh, modern uh, expressions of it, such as videos or magazine uh, illustrations.
uh, it's actually looking very interesting. The abstract for that is now on our Eventbrite page, so please try and look in for that if you can. Uh, beyond this, we'll be back to our usual first Monday of the month meetings. Uh, and in May, we have Dr. Christopher Rios joining us from America uh, on May the 3rd to talk about the early history of evangelical scientific organisations, including our own. So I hope he's kind. Uh, this will be followed in June, on June the 7th, with Dr. Hilary Marlowe, who will be joining us to discuss aspects of the environment and theology. Uh, sandwiched between those two events, though, on May the 7th and 8th will be the Christians in Science Northern Conference on the topic of digital theology and the church. Uh, because of the ongoing COVID restrictions, uh, we're not going to be able to meet in person for that. So that will be all online uh, and tickets and booking for that will again be on our Eventbrite page, hopefully in the next week or two. We have a great lineup of speakers uh, for that, that you may have caught at the start of this evening uh, on the screen. And they'll be talking on everything from the future of digital technology to social media to considerations about virtual afterlives. Uh, we'll also be hosting this year's uh, CIS Oliver Barclay lecturer, uh, who will be giving a talk on quantum physics as well. So if you haven't had your quantum itch fully scratched tonight, be sure to join us for that as well in May. Keep an eye, as I say, on our Eventbrite page for all the details on how to book in and where you can catch those talks. Uh, you can also subscribe to our mailing list to be kept up to date. Uh, you can find the address for that on the Manchester pages on the main Christians in Science website. So thank you again to our speaker tonight and thank you all for joining us. Until next month, keep staying safe. And although it's slightly early too, perhaps I uh, want to wish you all a very happy Easter. Good night. Mm -hmm.